It says, in this chapter, we will discuss the fall of man and the consequences thereof, the fall of Adam and Eve and the consequences of the fall. So I can start us off here and we can take turns like last time. <clears throat> the fall of Adam and Eve. Let us again turn to the book of Genesis to investigate the beginning of all the tragedies of mankind. In today's world, most people are familiar with this story compared to other times in human history. There are also now more interpretations, whether truthful and helpful or not, that seek to use it to support one's own understanding. Sadly, many are doing so without ever believing in its truthfulness. It seems that few have ever really examined it with a humble heart and appreciated it in the spiritual dimension where it belongs. However, to a large degree, the interpretation of this story reflects one's relationship with God. Without faith in God and a living relationship with Him, spiritual understanding and wisdom can never be attained. I kind of talked about that a little bit this last week. We can also venture to say that even, or one, even a believer, with, will not be able to go further in his pursuit of truth and life in the kingdom of God until the depths of this story, with its implications and applications in our lives, are understood in a very personal way. To move on in spiritual wisdom, we must reconcile our scattered understandings and embrace the spiritual reality. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> the story of God and man proceeds. This story of God and man proceeds from such a reality. Its spiritual rules also constitute many of the aspects of the fundamental order and ways in such reality. It calls for our serious consideration and careful scrutiny. Surely this must be done with a rightful fear or reverence of God and a good faith in his word and his ways. Ben, do you want to keep reading for us? Sure. <clears throat> Similar stories, but different results. In this chapter... We will not only give this story some or we will key, only you. Sorry. We will only give this story some key observations while comparing it to one when Jesus was tested in the wilderness. Genesis two. <laughs> now the Lord God had planted a garden in, in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Notice that the trees God gave to man to eat from are not bad. They were pleasing to the eye and good as food. Genesis 2.15-18 the Lord God took the man and put him in, in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord <coughs> God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper, a helper suitable for him. While God withheld nothing good from man, he did withhold what was bad from him. Now some may wonder why he put a tree there that would cause all the problems and heartache between him and mankind in the first place. Was it so the man would fall into temptation? Is God also the author of sin and evil? Let's be clear. This kind of questions reveal a fundamental misunderstanding of the nature and the ways of God. God always desired man to have a trusting and obedient heart towards him. God's way into eternal life and true fellowship with him is that man would hear and obey. Some claim God, God's love is unconditional. This might cause confusion unless we offer a proper definition of what unconditional means. 
For God does have, does have a condition for man, to be blessed by him and to love him. Jesus taught the man that man should follow his command out of his love and obedience unto God, which is the essence of the faith in God. The author of Hebrews states that without such a faith, it is possi impossible to please God. He uncon unconditionally offers all love, provision, benefit, and goodness to mankind. We have to repent from our wicked ways in order to receive the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life in Him. God did bless and is blessing every man with the gift of free will, meaning that man can choose to obey or to rebel against his ways. Note, without such a choice out of free will, there would have been no true obedience. However, in, gr in granting man this free will, God also blesses him with the ability, the grace, and the way to learn to know what to obey and how to obey. This is why he eagerly desires man to fellowship with him and to be taught by him. However, this has to be done willingly, not out of comp compulsion or without any understanding. Do we, know, do we not know what that faith, faith and obedience by nature are to be tried and tested? So, both the reason why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was put in the garden in the first place and the question of free will and predestination are answered by the necessity in God's purpose for man to obey and obedience comes through choice and choice comes through the ability to make a choice in the first place and so in many ways things can be understood as uh, there's things have to there has to be kind of a duality to nature for things to exist in the first place it just says there's a difference between land and sky because if there was no such thing as sky then there wouldn't be such thing as land either because there has to be something above the sky for either to exist. Or, for instance, uh, you in something as simple as uh, a cup, there has to be both the object of the cup and the emptiness inside it for it to serve its purpose. Like the, the, the matter of the cup gives, its, give it, gives it its value, but the emptiness of the cup gives, its, gives it its use. You see what I'm saying? There's always kind of a, a duality to the essence of existence that enables one to exist and the other to exist. So taking that into account, you have a uh, man who, like we had mentioned, was made in God's image. And in being destined for his likeness, we also mentioned that was a process, but that process comes through man's uh, learning to obey and learning to to love God and become like him through relationship by means of obedience and seeking after him. But in order for obedience to be a thing, there also has to exist a possibility to disobey, right? So to, to answer the question of why there was the potential for evil was to enable the potential for great good and blessing. So faith and obedience have, to, in a sense, to have a, a counterpart for existence. In order to consider oneself as faithful, there has to be an alternative to that. There has to be such a thing as a possibility as being unfaithful. To be obedient, it has to be there has to be a possibility to be disobedient, and man is given that choice by God or ordained by God. That's <laughs> kind of like what you said earlier. Man is ordained by God to have a choice, so predestined by God to choose. So it is it is kind of a 
a combination, but it's not a combination of men's ideas. It's actually the truth, regardless of what men think about what is determined or chosen. Their ideas are a an offshoot of that, that kind of warps a true understanding of what God's purpose is and what reality, how reality works. Do you want to keep reading for us? Didn't like my reading. No, we're just no, getting drunk. No, you didn't. <laughs> I'll just start back a sentence. Do we not know the kind of faith? Do we not know that faith and obedience by nature are to be tried and tested? So is true love. If it is not by choice, especially in the context of sacrificing one's own interest or well-being for another, <clears throat> such love is when shallow or even fault or even false wait. Such love is then shallow or even false and cannot be considered as genuine, sincere, or faithful. Man, man was, from the very beginning, created to be <coughs> participants and agents of the divine, faithful, and pure love of God. Created to be the recipients and dispensers of his kind, <coughs> of his kind of love, both to himself and to his fellow man. And to all of his creation. Without this innate ability, there would be no concept of love or the possibility to practice it. In a way, it would be fair to say that we could not be called human when deprived of this ability to love. So is what he's saying there making sense to you guys? Trying to trying to wrap it up in a little bow. Yeah. So it's, it's choice that enables something like love to be a reality to us, something yeah, that we can practice. Possible. Yeah. Because without choice, then... It's not even just... I mean, choice is basically a way of saying it's something that comes from your initiative, something, a, a way yeah. for your heart to express itself through some kind of action. That's essentially what choice is. It's, it should, we can, shouldn't get wrapped up with the, the actual term choice too much, but yeah. understand that choice is the manifestation of something that comes from, whether directly or indirectly, the deepest part of us, the depths of our hearts. And that's what enables something like love to be understood by us, relatable to us, and even expressed by us to the object of our love. That is what it's like to have been made. All, it's, that's also what it's like to have been made in God's image because we have that ability to choose just as God has the ability to choose. But it's being made in his likeness through the process of our spiritual walk and the process of sonship in that we begin to realize that there's actually a relational order to that image that we've been made into. There's, there's, a, there's a, a way. That's the, that's the simplest way to put it. There's a, there's a way of doing things as an individual. And since all things are relational, you can't have love uh, you can't know love or express love without relationships. There's also a way to function as a community of people. And between one another in that community and with each one, uh, between that one person and God, there's a particular way those things are to be practiced and played out. But none of that would be a reality in the first place if we didn't have that ability to choose. This ties back into what we were talking about and how men are born with innate capabilities and powers in uh, the way that they're able to 
to process life, think, and do things. Well, choice is a part of all of that. And just as we read last time too, that this can take two different paths. You can either do what you were destined to do with those that power essentially, or in other words, of having been made in the image of God, or you can take the opposite path. The, again, the ability to determine between two paths is in itself uh, an issue of choice. So you can keep reading. <clears throat> and this light becomes imperative for us to know that when God created man, he created us with the intention that we were to be perfected into the power and wisdom of his life, which is the pathway for us to be perfected in his love. In essence, God's will and good pleasure is that when we are facing the choice of our own free will versus his free will, we would, out of our love for him as our caring father and our trust in him as God of all faithfulness and power, to choose to obey him <clears throat> To obey him in order and to please him rather than to satisfy our own desires and pleasures for something or something other than him. Yeah, that kind of sums it up pretty well. Yeah. Because it wouldn't be real. Mm -hmm. There's a knowledge of what we could choose instead rather than mm -hmm. to obey him. And the fact that we choose him even in knowledge of what we could have chosen instead of him mm. is pleasing to him too. We can easily see that the heart of obedience towards his towards his heavenly father and his and his God vividly exemplifies is vivid vividly exemplified by Jesus' interaction with the devil in the wilderness, recorded in Luke 4. Concerning this, the author of Hebrews explains, this is Hebrews 2 14 through 18. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that his death, so that in his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he is to make, he is to be made, he, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become merciful and faithful, a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of his people, because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. So Jesus was a demonstration and a perfect example of someone that can live a life of essentially choosing God and his purposes in all things and at all times. So there was not there was a there was a again Jesus demonstrated, certainly demonstrated a way, like we discussed moments ago, but he also was the way. Remember, he proclaims himself to be the way and the truth and the life. And that through him, through his example and the life he demonstrated and what he opened up to us, even through his death on the cross and his resurrection, he opened up the possibility and opportunity for us to walk in that same way and live that same kind of life. That he did? Right, exactly. And the thought of him being, uh, him being tempted and suffering himself, kind of, so he's able to help humanity who is currently being tempted and you could say suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's an interesting concept too. Right. This is it's like, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting to see Jesus' life. He was basically, I mean, kind of like you're saying, he's, I mean, we hear the saying, the pattern of the sun, all that. I mean, there's even a book on it. 
his whole life is basically showing us how to do things. Mm-hmm. Especially like when you're spending a baby. Even when he was tempted and suffering. And especially when he died on the cross. A lot of people are deceived in thinking that he just died for us. He did, but that's not the only thing he was doing. He was dying to show us how to die, basically. He wasn't just doing that to, for our sins. But it's important to understand, too, because people have taken that kind of the wrong way. They, there is even the kind of a, a Jesus movement movement of sorts some decades ago where the primary message was uh, what would they say WWJD or Jesus something do? like what would Jesus do they, they had an emphasis on the character of Jesus and in every scenario in life if Jesus was here what would he do and how would he respond to that but that negates the the, the divine order and life that Jesus himself embodied that he wanted us to partake of rather than have a, a shallow understanding of what we thought we understood Jesus' character to be and how that would play out in whatever scenario in life we happen to be considering at the time. There's, there's a way... What those people don't understand is that Jesus was what he was because of his relationship With to the, the Father. Father. Yeah. And that it doesn't really apply if you don't have a relationship with the Father. Right. And so that whole idea is kind of flawed. Yeah, it, it misses it misses the point. It misses the point entirely of what Jesus was trying to open up to mankind. Yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's not possible. Even to come close to that without mm-hmm. that relationship. Yeah. Right. You can keep reading for us. Yep. Adam and Eve failed this test, temptation, as recorded in Genesis 3. Thus, sin and death entered the world. The seed of sonship was snatched away from mankind, and with it, the promise and covenant of eternal life. Even so, Jesus was victorious over the devil and death. Out of obedience, he willingly walked flawlessly without missing anything in the will of his heavenly Father. He thus became the perfect sacrifice of atonement for the sins, missing the mark, of all mankind. Even of the whole world, cosmos, creation, or this age, he completed He completely yielded to the will of his heavenly Father in order to please him, even to the point of death on the cross. Now let's read these two stories together. And this is Genesis 3, 1 through 13. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He had said to the woman, Did God really say, you must not eat from the tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it, or you will die. You will surely die. The serpent said, You You will not surely die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was for good, was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they <coughs> so they sewed, what does that even mean? Sewed. Mm-hmm. sewed. No, sewed. That's what I thought. Sewed fig, leaf, fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord... God as he was walking into the garden in the cool of day. 
in the cool of the day. And they hid from him, the Lord among, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, to, yeah, to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. <clears throat> and this is Luke 1 through 13 now, or Luke 4, 1 through 13. So again, remember, we're comparing the first temptation and then this, the first great temptation and yeah. the second great temptation. Which was Jesus. Jesus in the desert is the second one. Yep. So we just read the first temptation mm-hmm. of man, and now we're going to. There's an intentional comparison here that we'll be yeah. expounding on. Yeah, so this is Luke 4, 1 through 13. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert. Led by the Spirit in the desert. Where for forty days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during these days, and at the end of them he was hungry. As the devil the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written. Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor for it has been given to me. And I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem Jerusalem, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down there. <clears throat> For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. <clears throat> Jesus answered, It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until the opportune time. Elijah, you want to continue? Yeah. Sorry, before we continue, I'd maybe a little restless and I was kind of... Seeking the Lord a little bit about that just now. Um, I know that Lolly and Dan had a red house right now, and not even bigger there or whatever. Um, I kind of f- felt kind of like a heaviness on, on me right now about that, so I think we should address that a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to be like. What do you mean a heaviness? A heaviness <clears throat> because of the being there, or you like want to see them, or I understand? No. No, uh, I went in before we left just to say hi to him before I leave. I don't know, it's right when I left the house, I kind of, not heaviness, of, no, not like I wish I could be there. There's something a little bit insidious that I feel. I don't, I'm not trying to be like spiritual or yeah. in that way. Well, but it's good to be sensitive to those things. <clears throat> so I just think at least somebody should maybe pray about that yeah. before I don't mention that. Lord, I pray that you would continue to expose, Lord, any force that is trying to hinder the work of your Spirit in our midst here. And, uh, Father, we know that regardless of the, the, the personality that may be allowing that force to, or that Spirit to uh, work, and uh, have influence over our minds and hearts. Uh, doesn't have to be aware of it, oh Lord, but you give us the, the sensitivity to, to detect these things and oh Lord, the, 
the grace and authority to deal with them. And so, Father, I do pray, uh, Isaac, you want to lay hands on Isaac, or on uh, Elijah with me. Lord, we do pray that, uh, Lord, whatever may be, Lord, trying to to cover or to to constrict or cause a sense of unrest to Elijah's heart and his mind or to any one of us, Lord, whether it is something that we are conscious of or not, we pray that you would bring release in Jesus' name. And Father, we, uh, Lord, we have no time and we will have no place, Lord, for these spirits to, uh, to cause this uh, disturbance in, Lord, a time that we set apart to, to receive from you and to grow together as, uh, as spiritual people and as sons in your house. And so, Father, I pray for a continued exposure, an exposure that brings, uh, Lord, release and a, even a judgment upon these things that would seek to uh, uh, rear their heads in defiance um, of you and the work, the wonderful work that you have uh, started and sustained in our midst. And so, Lord, uh, I pray for a, a godly confidence to rise up within us. Um, Lord, to to sit at your table, Lord, regardless of the, the voices that may be screaming around us, Lord, to distract and to discourage, and Lord, to choose nonetheless to partake of what you have before us and to, to do so uh, with, um, Lord, the, the wisdom and the, the energy that you give us to walk these things out in spirit and in truth. And uh, Lord, not to be led by our minds or by our emotions, Lord, not to be enticed or distracted or even discouraged by the flesh, Lord, but to learn to, to walk and to fellowship and to live by the Spirit, which is uh, to us as your sons, Lord, the wellspring of all life. And so I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus' name. Do you have anything else the Lord to reveal to you about that? <clears throat> Even while we were praying? Mm-hmm. Well, as I think it's just interesting because we can look at this as like obviously maybe a thing that's bad. I think it's I think it's a good thing because we can obviously see that the enemy doesn't want us doing this. And then the enemy doesn't want something happening it means it's a good thing. It means it's means it's something that's going to hinder the enemy and something that's going to further our relationship and bond and sonship and all everything in the Lord. So I think I I take this personally as an encouragement for us today. Yeah. So I think it's a good it's like almost a, a breaking of a familiar spirit too. Honestly, yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah. You know, kind of getting out of the comfort zone. I see it as, a, as an encouragement to speak up when those things are being discerned. Mm-hmm. For sure. And this ties in even to what we're talking about with, even in moments like these, making the choice to to respond to it in uh, a way that does uh, uh, allow us to to rise in our spiritual man to confront things that are working or opposing against what the Lord is doing within us. So the consequence of those choices we make in such moments are are heightened and intensified uh, as a result of the pressure we face. So essentially what I mean to say is that the more pressure there is to oppose what the Lord is doing, the more power and effect is behind the choices we make to, to pursue and forge ahead nonetheless. 
So bless the Lord. I, mm -hmm. I pray that there would continue to be a revealing and uh, breakthrough too. Mm -hmm. This is not even just tied to this situation. There's actually a lot that's been stirring spiritually in our community and there's a lot, been a lot of opposition from the enemy. So definitely uh, continue on with a prayerful heart. Elijah, you want to keep reading? Yeah. <clears throat> what caused the fall of man? The scriptures tell us that the serpent was crafty and that the devil used his craftiness to deceive man. Interestingly, God had given man dominion over the serpent before this happened. Adam and Eve should have taken, should have been able to discern the lies of the serpent, rebuke it, and watch it flee in terror. For man was given the power not only to discern his evil schemes, but even to judge him. This is what it means to subdue things under one's authority. The authority and power God gave us would enable him to not only judge the serpent, but all created things. If we relate to this to if we relate this to what Jesus taught in the New Testament, we would know that Adam and Eve were to learn to judge even the angels. In this light, we, as sons of God, should have no fear of the devil, his demons, or the evil, evil angels. However, we do not we do however we do need to have the fear of God within us so that we do not disobey God and allow the devil to gain foothold in our lives. There you go. <laughs> We're kind of uh, learning these things through practice rather than just through a page. Yeah. Now let's look closer at the lies the serpent spoke to Eve compared to the one he offered to Jesus. First, he twisted God's command and tried to lure Eve into, to deny the goodness of God concerning his provision for them. Ha, it is not about food. It now we know food. what? It is about food. Oops. It is about food. Now we know Adam and Eve were enjoying the abundance of the Garden of Eden. In contrast, Jesus had not been able to eat or drink for 40 days. The devil did not bother to challenge Adam and Eve about whether they were sons of God or not. However, with his perverted reasoning, he shamelessly tried to undermine Jesus. Jesus' knowledge and confidence as whether he was truly God's son. In essence, Satan tried to lure Jesus to forfeit his identity as the son of God and thus his birthright and inheritance from the father. Does this tie it all to Esau? Oh, because um, I mentioned birthright? Um, sure. Maybe. Yeah, it certainly does. and I, Because that... Um, that has to do with that, the birthright or inheritance we have as sons of God to, to walk out that spiritual destiny that we're given by God to become mature sons of God. To Esau, that was something that was, that had no value to him. In fact, he was a man obviously governed by the flesh because he traded his birthright for a bowl of soup. Well, it was something of value to Jacob, even though he procured it through uh, dishonest means. Re regardless of that, it was the heart behind the, that situation that caused God to, to love Jacob, but to actually hate Esau. Because through his, the, the control that the flesh had over his mind, he, he chose instinct, actually literally chose instant gratification over the eternal destiny of him as a son in God's house. That's how powerful the dominance of the flesh can be. God of the stomach. So that, yeah, so. and I, I, do, I do definitely think that will be something that will be covered later on too and expanded on in oh, relation yeah, sure. to the, a, a kind of approaching sonship from another angle. <clears throat> When we take a closer look at the story, the devil even tempted our Lord to become his heir rather than the heir of God, his heavenly father. In reading Eve's reply to the devil, notice that she knew that God had treated both she and her husband as one. 
or one party of the covenant. When he gave them the command regarding the tree of knowledge, good and evil, and the provision of his promise of life, even life eternal. Now, during the interaction between Eve and the serpent, Adam was present but did not intervene. He failed to assume his place of authority and responsibility to exercise counsel, wisdom, or judgment over the matter that was his duty to safeguard and judge. Luke 3.37, Galatians 3.26-9. Why did he say, why did he, why he did nothing is easy to discern. Being tempted himself and falling into the weakness of his own flesh. He could not resist the urge to touch what was unknown and desirable. A similar story is recorded in the evil royal family of Ahab and Jezebel, which was another example of God used in the human history to teach us about spiritual position and divine order. With these spiritual responsibility and with these spiritual responsibility and obedience. A side note. It is quite sobering when we consider this in the light of the contemporary of contemporary Christianity and the secular world today. How many people are being tempted by supernatural power and spiritual mysteries and are lured into false religion, idol worship, spiritual mysticism, witchcraft, fortune telling, mediums, etc. All the while they remain ignorant of the fact that these the very kinds of spiritual foods of God which would never want man to protect which God would never want man to partake. Second, Satan imputed doubt into man's mind regarding the truthfulness and faithfulness of God and his willingness and power to protect him. In essence, Satan was communicating that God could not be trusted, so man would have to trust in himself and his own wisdom and ability. And that ties a lot to life. The independent spirit, which we've been talking about a lot recently. It's interesting. Mm. So, you think... Never mind. What were you thinking? Just, I wonder if that... I was wondering if that tied to religion at all. The, the independent spirit. Right, because religion, in essence, is... Uh, man's mind manipulating spiritual truth... Unto his own ends. I feel like it's it's almost trying to fit it into a little box so they can understand it. It's almost kind of... Well, in a sense, yes. But, I mean, yes. It, the result of religion is very often a watered-down yeah. version of truth. Whether, for, whether or not that's unto the purpose of making it more digestible or easier uh, to deal with in the sense that it's more conducive to the way you want to live your life so you can have a religious tone to a self-led life. Basically, let me serve God the way I want to. And all that is rooted in definitely a kind of independent spirit because it's led by self. And... I think an important thing to note here is there's there was a kind of uh, innocence with the case of Adam and Eve in that they didn't have the obviously didn't have the discernment to identify the devil as uh, a force that was in direct opposition to God, but they were very quickly tempted. Um, by him and I think what this exposes especially in uh, contrast to Jesus' example uh, it, it exposes the lack actually of relationship that they had to God even in the garden as the first beings made in his image so they were uh, despite the the perfection that they were created in, in a sense, there was still that lack of likeness that was achieved by Jesus, which enabled him to resist the temptation because he was a true son of God. That same likeness had not yet been achieved 
or even really started by Adam and Eve, which disabled them from being able to discern in the first place Satan as Satan. So there's a a level of spiritual maturity that comes through the process of being made in his likeness and uh, being and through that maturity our ability to resist temptation and identify opposing spiritual force. Is that making sense? Yeah. <clears throat> God's verdict for those who choose to eat from the tree of good and knowledge of the tree of knowledge of good and evil or partake of a wisdom that is not from him this is he will surely die oh how subtle are his, are the ways of the devil you see when satan said to eve you will not surely die he challenged the judgment of god concerning his sovereignty as if there were things god did not know and could not control the devil also challenged God's goodness, as if he would withhold good things from man. The truth, however, is that God intends for man to be fully to fully know him, even as he is unknown. In, his in, in this intimate relationship, God would withhold nothing from him in terms of his goodness, his wisdom, his power, and even his honor and glory. He will give man all things as a beloved son and blessed heir. Even so, on a son's part, obedience is required to receive such a rich inheritance. Now compare this to Jesus in the desert. When the devil tempted Jesus to throw himself down in the pinnacle of the temple, Jesus was facing a test of similar nature. That is, God's judgment and power concerning death and life. Notice, in this test, it is not so much a matter of whether or not the help of angels would be available to Jesus. That is, God, his Father, would fail to fulfill the word or promise. Oh, that is, would God, his Father, fail to fulfill his word or promise concerning his Son? Rather, it was more of a matter of his faith in his Father's judgment. That is, would a son distrust God, his father, to venture into something outside of his counsel and instruction? As an obedient son of God, will not test or tempt the heavenly father, because that would only happen when his heart is in not the right place. No, the true son will, with trust, learn to obey the Father in all things. And that's what Jesus was an example of, was someone who did obey the Father in every aspect in and area and circumstance of life. How foolish then are those who will throw away all restraint and put God to the test. They may not question his goodness, but they will question his judgment, not knowing that his judgment embodies justice, his justice, righteousness, and truthfulness. They would dare to provoke God to anger and would even to point, even to the point of having to demonstrate his power and judgment of wrath. So that's why even that last temptation that Satan gave Jesus on the, the cliffside, as it was kind of seeming to be demonstrated, where you can cast yourself down. And he, he, Satan actually quoted scripture. He said, it says in the scripture that angels will literally catch you and not allow your foot to strike a stone. But then Jesus, in his knowledge, not only in the goodness of God, to not allow him to, to injure himself by casting himself from the cliffside, had also a, a true understanding of, as it says here, the judgment and justice and, righteous and tr righteousness and truthfulness of God, knowing that there would be it would be out of order for him to do so in the first place because that would be putting God to the test and questioning or it would that would be an action brought about by a doubt in God's <clears throat> justice and righteousness and truthfulness. So there were, that would in a sense be doing something that was not in obedience to the Father and if it's not in obedience, then it's disobedience, which provokes God's wrath. That's putting God to the test. And so God and Jesus knew instantly 
that's not <laughs> that's not something uh to be done even if it seems to be in the way that Satan was uh misconstruing it even if it seemed to be in line with scripture even mm. it's understanding the heart of the father that enables uh, even something as insidious and crafty as throwing scripture at a person uh, can't confuse or trouble the mind with. <clears throat> Disobedience is, by nature, divina- divination, as Sam- Samuel rightfully put it, for it is to test God. First Samuel 15. The Apostle John said that sin is lawlessness, which is the doorway for the lawless one or the anarchist to work through the dis- oops Antichrist to work through the disobedience of man. First John three four. Why? Because sin in such a context is to distrust, to distrust God's character, which his goodness and love issued from his divine nature. To distrust his ways, which are his righteousness and justice, justice, upheld by his authority and power. Such a sinful or unbelieving heart naturally makes God's love and grace powerless. Repentance is the only way out of it. I can keep reading for us here. The third temptation is related to our glory or perfection in God or the true purpose of human existence. The devil challenged Eve with two things. One, whether or not God has man's best in mind. Two, whether or not he knows how to accomplish it. Eve fell into the second trap. She acknowledged the goodness of God when she stated that man had not been forbidden to eat of any of the fruit in the garden, either natural or spiritual, the tree of life, except one the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which would induce the judgment of death. Hey, that's okay. No worries. However, she was tempted to believe at the persuasion of the devil that somehow she could find her own way to gain wisdom and become like God by distrusting his goodness and disobeying his strict command. Adam did the same when he became a partner in Eve's sin. In contrast, however, Jesus did not fall into the sin. Never had he asked for any false glory, nor ever attempted to attain God's promise by his own means. Even when the devil conveniently offered it to him, seemingly without any real cost, Jesus refused to bow and worship the devil. There's a host of scriptures there. Later, he readily shared with his disciples this truth. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world by having forfeited his own soul. Surely Jesus knew what was at stake. Today, cultural relevance, social pragmatism, and secular humanism, which serve man's interests rather than God's, have permeated the diverse streams of wisdom, religion, and philosophy in the world. In the guise of God's goodness and the brotherhood of man, they have even infiltrated the ranks of Christianity with all kinds of doctrines and practices. It is sad to witness that the yeast of modern Pharisees and Sadducees subtly finds its way into the forums and pulpits of God's people. With such a deluge of deception, it is difficult to stand firm, remaining untainted and uncompromising in God's pure truth and holiness, and commit ourselves totally to Him for our well-being and for the values of life. A thick veil is covering the minds of many, keeping them from being able to trust, hear, and obey God. Many invisible chains and yokes forge. Forged by the deceptive waves of the evil one are enslaving and oppressing the very people who are eagerly seeking God and willing to serve him with a genuine and devout heart. How sad. But glory to God, a holy remnant is now rising up from the rubbles and ruins of man's futility and vanity. A people with a pure heart and a holy passion are eagerly and diligently seeking to truly know and represent their Father in heaven and to go about his business on earth with his divine wisdom and empowerment. 
We are witnessing in this unique day of mankind a light shining forth brilliantly from the thick darkness. Even now, more darkness is being unleashed and its attempt to cover over this dying and hopeless world is being intensified. But God is forging a strong and faithful people to make a difference. Indeed, when evil comes like a flood, God will raise up a holy standard so that his knowledge and glory will break out from all darkness and cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Has he not promised us this day in his word? Now his day is coming. Consequences of the fall. The consequences of man's fall are severe and grievous. Here are a few. Man lost the privilege to fellowship with God, who is spirit, and with it, he lost the opportunity to learn wisdom and love from him. Much of man's initial capacity for spiritual life and understanding was shut down when the spirit of sonship was taken away. This means that man would no longer be able to communicate with God in the way he had originally intended for him, which is to fellowship with him as a father would with his son. Through this relationship, he would teach his sons all things and have his sons grow up to be just like him. The divine process of producing sons of God through the human race and transforming man into his spiritual offspring was cut off. So the way we have in order to enter into the life of sonship, which is, again, it's a process. It's something that we must mature into. It's not something that's instantly granted. Even that was cut off from that sin Adam and Eve made in falling into the temptation of the servant. And as it will expound here in a second, that we will see as something that was uh, made available again to us by Jesus. Through his example, his life, through his death, which that's what the next chapter will go into is the cross, and through his resurrection. Two, man lost the authority and privilege to represent God to creation and rule over it, which is one of the first things God ordained for man when he created him is you know, we will rule over the beast of the field and the sea and the birds of the air. He lost that authority and privilege to represent God to creation and rule over it, which is to impart his wisdom, glory, and love. We lost our position as kings and priests in his kingdom and household. By his original design and kingship, we would rule with righteousness on God's behalf as his sons. He himself would be the judge of all judges and the king of all kings. In priesthood, we would act as ministers or servants as a covenant of eternal life between God and those who are to learn of him to the whole of creation. This service is in order to impute his wisdom, order of peace, and love to them and to teach them his goodness, holiness, righteousness, and faithfulness. Three, man lost his power over the devil and thus over the angelic realm and the earthly realm. He was weakened and for the most part became powerless to withstand the evil one's schemes and assaults. The devil usurped our dominion over God's creation both in the angelic realm as well as in the earthly realm. The, the world, this creation or this age, was thus caught up in a war between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God and his Christ. Only in Christ Jesus are we freed from the terror of the evil one and the fear of death. In this sense, we also lost our protection in God as sons of Adam. We, as sons of Adam, became slaves of sin and death, victims of evil and deception. Man lost the blessing of God's provision, physical as well as spiritual. He had no access to the substance of spiritual life in God anymore. More so as a punishment for sin and disbelief and as a reminder of his miserable state and powerless position, God made man labor by the sweat of his brow as a lowly creature just to sustain his earthly life in a cursed world. From the moment that he is born into the world, he is in corruption. All the while, the everlasting call of the Father was for man to return to his spiritual home. Woman is to suffer pain in childbirth, symbolizing man's fate of suffering until death. That is, he is to be born with suffering and pain, only to return to dust without a trace. How sad is the fall of man, and how miserable his end. 
In sin and unto death he toils in a cursed world and groans inside, never able to be truly free. Five. Man lost eternal life in God. Mankind was doomed, along with all creation, to decay and to perish in the end. The tree of life was out of man's reach after he cast, he was cast out of the garden. It was guarded by water and fire, by cherubim with fiery swords to execute the judgment of death. Can you imagine how sad it would be for us to be cast away from our earthly father and mother in our home where our family gathers together? Yet man as a race was cast away from his family in heaven and from the purest form of life and love, which had promised to be abundant and most fulfilling, even a life filled with the very glory and blessedness of God. Six, man lost peace, love, and righteousness in life. As we can see, because of sin and shame, Adam began to blame Eve, and Eve turned around to blame the serpent. The tragedy continued. Their firstborn child, Cain, killed his brother, Abel, out of jealousy. Blood was shed between brothers and within a family. For the first time, innocent blood and death were tasted by the very soil that should have been the seedbed of life, peace, and happiness. Sin quickly brought about the degradation of man's heart towards his fellow beings. Had Christ not come, war and death would never withdraw themselves from the fate of mankind until his flesh is taken away and the creation is wrapped up. 7. Man lost many abilities to create, to gain wisdom and understanding, and to love God, uh, love as God would love. Even the natural faculties of our being were locked up. Man's span of life was shortened. Disease and pain began to inflict mankind. Man was now witness or to witness and be afflicted by all forms of sickness, wickedness, sorrow, and suffering. In a sense, man became a miserable creation, burning with a sense of loss and dissatisfaction as his faculties of love and understanding were locked up by his own lowly form of life, marred by his selfish desires and sinful cravings. Without God, we are doomed. Without God, we are lost. Without God, we are living beings of lack. Without God, we are creatures of misery. From dust we come, and to dust we return. We perish like grass. We wither like a flower. We are carried off as in a flood. We are gone as with the wind. There was a lot that we lost in that one act of disobedience. Well, what that did was create a like a universal dichotomy between the results of obedience to God and the results of disobedience to God. And at the beginning of creation there, obviously the first result of, of disobedience through the failure to resist the first temptation is what brought about everything that can be considered (laughs) uh, not resulting of a life lived in sonship, basically everything that is bad and wicked and uh, unholy in creation. It's not something, it's very interesting to consider, it's not something that was created by God, the world wasn't created uh, with that mixture. That mixture came as a result of man's disobedience to God. Because, I mean, it's not as if God was unaware that that's what the result would be mm-hmm. if man decided to disobey him by partaking of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But nonetheless, because it is a part of his purpose for man to have that choice to obey him, he still allowed it to be something that was a potential to happen. And it did happen. And why did it happen? Because Adam and Eve 
weren't brought to that place of perfection yet where they <laughs> could identify uh, the, the wily, tempting nature of the serpent. And they were not even in that place to be able to uh, live a life of perfect obedience because they, they, weren't, they had not been fully made sons yet. They had not reached the place of uh, likeness to the Father. And so, in a sense, it's, it's hard not to see it as something that was in a, meant to happen in that it enabled later on the uh, I guess you can call it the drama, if you will, of God's purpose played out later on through the rise of the nation of Israel as a holy nation chosen by God to begin to renew this way, uh, to begin to, to establish on earth once more the possibility of sonship. Because that's literally what Israel means, which was, I think it was Jacob, his name was changed to Israel, and it became the nation of Israel. Israel is uh, referring to a prince. So that's the son of a king. It's, it was the beginning of bringing back that order of sonship. And even Israel <laughs> failed many, many times. You, you, I mean, you know the story. I won't go over it all again. And then it's down the road that we have Jesus, who, again, I'm reiterating myself, you know this very well, but he's the one that opened that way again because he was a true son. That's probably the most profound way to understand who Jesus was and why he came, is he was a true son. And that's, this is kind of a hard chapter to, to leave or to finish uh, the night with only because it very uh, quickly and intentionally leads into it the next chapter. Well. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't end well, but it, it leads into uh, the cross, which is what we'll be going into next, which is... Which is kind of like the, the redemption to the fact of everything that we failed. It's, yeah, it's the reconciliation. It's, it's the way being made available again. And I, I really do uh, pray that that's something that the Lord, like the, the, real, the, the real beauty and even personal impact that that recognition has will be something real to you guys, even as we go through it together. Um, so as always, I would just strongly encourage you guys to, uh, to pray that as we go through these writings, it's something that becomes uh, something that becomes um, tangible to your spirit. It's something that is is not a, a a distant look on what God's purpose is in a general detached sense, but something that's real to you as someone who is a part personal. of this. Yeah, it's something that's personally is something that's that you know you're walking in mm-hmm. and real to you in that way. It's an interesting time tonight because I, I didn't even particularly feel it until we started myself, but there was kind of a, a general sense of discouragement. I'll be really honest with you guys. I, I really, I don't feel like I'm very good at <laughs> uh, trying to express myself in my, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts, but uh, just so that you know some of my inhibitions, I, I don't really do well to uh, expounding on things even though I have a, a strong heart to do it and I, I'm also aware of the fact that going through this time together is kind of how I will learn anyways it's how all sure. of us will learn mm-hmm. but I've mentioned it before but I just really appreciate you guys bearing with me and uh, <laughs> it's I do, no trouble for us <laughs> yeah. I do pray that this is uh, an opportunity for us to learn how to open up and express our hearts um yeah, uh, not that I am praying that God will make me into an eloquent speaker, but I want Him to be able to to speak in and through me and even teach me and teach through me. 
I felt that. In a way that's not even in my control. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously you guys will be a testimony to me and how the Lord impacts you in that way. Uh, whether it's through me or through the book we're reading uh, or even directly from the Father himself into your, into your heart as these things are opened up to you. So. Well, just know that none of us are ever going like, to tolerate you. No, I, I, uh, I don't think so. I just, I, it's usually more self-directed. <laughs> Probably not. <but> anyways. <laughs> Lord, I thank you for this time. and Lord, I, I just... I do pray that you would continue to uh, expand our hearts. And Lord, we, uh, we thank you for the faithful work that you are uh, bringing about in uh, our spiritual lives. And all of the opportunity that we have to, to grow together. And um, Lord, would you awaken within each one of us a, an earnest and unquenchable uh, desire for your truth, or perhaps not totally unquenchable, Lord, for you are so willing to, to reveal that truth to us. Um, Lord, when we lay all aside uh, in this earthly life, Lord, to pursue it, um, Father, we, we do want to be students of your word and of your living ways. Uh, Lord, students, true students of life. Uh, Lord, for every moment can be learned from and reflected upon. Uh, Lord, not in an in inordinate way or overbearing way. Lord, spending too much time in our minds, Lord. But even as you gave us an example today, Lord, uh, we are able to practice the the spiritual truth that you give to us, and uh, Lord, even as we read too, and man having originally lost his ability to to uh, to overcome the world and overcome the flesh and overcome Satan, Lord, you have given us and renewed this authority to us. So, Lord, may we live in that reality and uh, walk in your victory and in your confidence. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.